Well, thank you, Mike, uh, for that uh, kind introduction and for framing the next 40 minutes. We've, as he's introduced the panel, we've got a great uh, number of uh, panelists here to talk about a topic that is near and dear to a lot of our hearts. Uh, anybody would have to live under a rock or in a cave to not understand the pervasiveness of opioids in our society. And we are going to kind of focus on the perioperative period, and there certainly is linkage to what we do in the perioperative period to the opioid uh, epidemic uh, in the United States. But first, I just want to take a personal privilege here to thank Joe, Mike, Mike, and, um, uh, you know, for a great, exceptional meeting. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. And Santa's too, I can't uh, you know, forget her. The, the light was kind of blinding me, so I saw you there. But more importantly than putting on a great meeting, I want to thank you for putting the patients' stories at the forefront of what we do. That is how we connect to real change, to ignite uh, change. Uh, the heart of medicine and how much these stories hurt uh, to hear, but I can't imagine uh, what everyone went through uh, here. And again, that, that, that is how we um, make change. Safety, I think, will improve only if those stories are felt every day in the systems of healthcare and the people that work in healthcare. We need to be reminded that medicine goes way beyond doing things rapidly, quickly, efficiently, new technology. Not that that's not important, but it is the humanness uh, that matters. And with that, we want to start off with a story uh, from Yvonne. Thank you, Dan. Um, just to tell my story um, about my son, I thought the easiest way to, to relate that would be to go back to the day that ended me here. Um, I was sitting in church, and my daughter leaned over and said, Mom, look at your phone. And so I pulled my phone out of my bag, and I had a message from my daughter-in-law to call her. So I got up and left the meeting, and as I did, my phone rang. And the only thing I remember her telling me is that he's not breathing. So I went back in, and I grabbed my husband and, the, and my children, and we drove over to my son's house, and when we arrived there, the ambulance was there and the police, and an EMT walked up to me and said, it's too late. I'm like, what? My son just had a tonsillectomy. How can it be too late? He's 21 years old, perfectly healthy. I, I was so confused, and I tried to go in the house, but then the police were like, no, this is a crime scene. I'm like, what is going on? Um, and. So we stood, it was a December morning, it was 20 degrees, we stood outside in our church clothes and tried to process what was happening. Um, it was a few hours and they finally let me in to see my son. I had to hug him for the last time in a body bag. They already had him in a body bag. And he was still warm. He, they figured he'd been dead two hours by the time my daughter-in-law found him. Even though they, she tried to, to revive him initially, it was of no use because he had already been gone too long. But um, jump forward a few days. We, uh, it took six months to get back his autopsy and we were told that he died of pneumonia. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, um, we, it was a week, it was a week after my son's death till I finally checked my phone for messages and I had a message from my son's ENT and it was 11.30 at night and he, he had told me, just call me, you know, I've talked to the coroner, got results, uh, the initial results. And so I phoned him at 11.30 at night and we had a long conversation for about an hour and he talked about um, a few minor things. They hadn't find any uh, injury from the surgery. The surgery was fine, no problems there. But they hadn't really come to any conclusions of what his cause of death might be. So six months later, 
um, well, in the meantime, Dr. Canton was his name. He, he, had, he was right there the whole time trying to help us through this because he couldn't understand how a healthy 21-year-old, physically fit young man could go to bed at night with his wife and not wake up the next morning. Um, so he was trying to also rectify this problem be, um, because after my son's death, he was, you know, he was a football player in the, on the high school team and he was super outgoing, super friendly. So he was well known and we lived in a small community and stories started pouring in of, of other incidents like this because you know, we were told, well, the police first off said, you know, this is an overdose. I'm like, no, because this child of mine, this child just didn't even like taking medications. So I knew that that was not the cause, no matter if that's what they thought it was initially. I knew as a mother that that is not what had happened to my son. And um, I, I got a message from a friend of mine that said her neighbor's daughter that was three years old had died like my son. He, she. She'd had a tonsillectomy, her mother had given her medicine, put her to bed, she said her daughter was up playing, feeling, you know, feeling fine, but the doctor told her just to stay on top of the pain. And so she gave her daughter medicine, put her to bed, and then she woke up realizing that her daughter hadn't woke her up during the night, and she went in to check on her and just found her that she'd also been gone too long to be able to be revived. Um, three months after my son's death, death, we got a call from a neighbor, she actually lived only a mile from my home. I didn't know her at the time. But her daughter had also been rushed to the ER. They had found her, she had a tonsillectomy, also by the same physician. And he had set, sent her home with a pulse oximeter. But it was an older style, didn't alarm. Um, he had told her, keep checking it just to watch your levels. And um, when my daughter-in-law and I went over to visit with her, she had told us the last time, you know, she remembered seeing that. She's a 15-year-old girl that went to the local high school. She said she, she thought it said 40. And, and her mom said she'd last talked to her like at 3.40, perhaps 2.45 or 3.45 at night. And then 15 minutes later, her mom just woke up and noticed her daughter was laying there blue, unresponsive, not breathing. And it had only been 15 minutes since she'd last talked with her daughter. And... Um, her sister, of course, was called up. They started giving her CPR, and they lost her twice. They, they got her back. They lost her before the ambulance got there. Then they gave her seven doses of Narcan before she made it to the hospital, which was only five minutes away, to help her um, come out of that. But she lived. She's amazing. She just got married. She's, you know... Um, and I love that story because... Um, as I was researching this with my son, we found five people in our small community that had died the same way as my son. A three-year-old, 28-year-old male, he had been found after a tonsillectomy, just unresponsive. His girlfriend came to check on him, and he was dead. 35-year-old um, woman from a nearby community whose mother lived um, close to us. Her daughter had found her unresponsive on the couch, and they called an ambulance, and she was able to be saved. But um, through my research, there were just many other people that had lost their lives for such a simple thing. And when the doctor had started sending home the pulse oximetry, the pulse oximeters with his patients, he was seeing quite a bit of patients coming back with issues. And he was attributing that to saving their lives because otherwise they wouldn't have known that there was a problem brewing um, before they could help get treatment. But I'm just, I'm just glad that this yeah. community is working to correct these problems because I didn't even know it was such an issue. We had no idea that you could die, you know, not necessarily from the tonsillectomy, but just from the pain medication that they gave you afterwards. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 If, if, if that story doesn't bring tears to your eyes, your, your heart's not beating, so it's just... 
like a gut punch. Uh, next, I think uh, Frank and George are going to kind of tag team here and yeah. give us some information on the macro system of uh, opioids sure. and the harm they're doing and uh, focus on the perioperative uh, environment. So Yvonne's son's uh tragedy happened outside the hospital. And we all know about the opioid epidemic. 100,000 plus patients a year die, m many from opioids. But we've had an opioid crisis inside our hospitals for a lot longer. 35 million patients are admitted to the hospital every year in the US. 50 to 60% of those get opioids for pain, moderate to severe pain. Opioids are wonderfully, wonderful analgesics, very effective. Mr. Kiani attested to that yesterday but they can also be dangerous. 0.5% of patients who get opioids have a severe opioid adverse event, including critical respiratory depression. And a number of these patients have these on the med surge floors, on the wards. 40% of those respiratory arrests end up in death. Now, these aren't fragile patients with lots of comorbidities. These are often young patients uh, with few comorbidities, elective admissions, people sitting next to you going for an elective procedure tomorrow uh, who are suffering this uh, adverse event. Why don't we have a safety culture around opioids like we have around DVTs, like we have around bed sores, like we have around falls? The reason is because opioid deaths in the hospital remain a diagnosis of exclusion patient that was found unresponsive. We, we don't know. If an autopsy is done, typically the, the cause of death is fatal arrhythmia or cardiac ischemia. If you all stop breathing for 20 minutes, you're all going to have a fatal arrhythmia and cardiac ischemia. Lori Lee wrote an article where she looked at the amount of time between when a patient was found in respiratory arrest on the ward and when they were last seen, and the average was about 45 minutes and the modal was over an hour. We have patients we find unresponsive in our hospitals, catastrophic for the patients and their families, traumatic for the providers, an embarrassment for our hospitals. And not all of them react like UC Irvine. A lot of them call risk management. So what we need is we need a safety culture around opioids like we have around some of these other issues. Three elements in my mind, education. Ask a surgeon why the, how they write their orders for, for opioids. That's what I learned during training 20, 30 years ago. A lot of front time uh, bedside providers are still confused on exactly how opioid-induced resp respiratory depression happens. You don't breathe five, four, three, two, one. You often, we see chaotic breathing. We see breath holding, breath pausing. We see snoring. I read in the chart, patient resting comfortably, snoring. That's not comforting. That's a red flag in patient who's getting opioids. A couple of months ago, I read about, a, in the chart, during COVID, a new graduate nurse had doubled the dilated dose at 2 AM for an opioid naive patient. It's the last drug he ever got. This is still going on. So education, huge education gap that we need to fill. We need quality metrics, and we need the regulatory and credentialing agencies to get on this. Quality metrics to peel back the veil of opioid deaths in the hospital. Fortunately, CMS has put a new quality metric out for 2023 relating to re reversal. We're making some progress. But think what happened in 2000 after the IOM report. All, within two years, everybody had a rapid response team in hospitals across the country. And in 2010, the intensivists who run those typically got together for the rapid response symposium and they looked at the results. And they said, yes, we've made some progress on failure to rescue. But they made another conclusion. They said, we have a problem in the detection side of our loop, the afferent loop. We are not finding people early enough. And they also made a recommendation. If 
practical and affordable, all patients in the ward should be monitored continuously. If practical and affordable, we can keep people from dying. It, it speaks to the psychology of, these are good docs, these are passionate people, but it's zero tolerance is not in our vocabulary as doctors, and it needs to be. Um, so that brings me to, uh, the, the other thing uh, that they said, so it brings me to basically continuous monitoring. I'm a huge fan of continuous monitoring, how can you not? I mean, you, see, you read the, the work from George and, and Sue McGrath and, and folks who've done this, and they've been doing this for 15 years. I was doing the math. Seven, he said 17 years. We're there. We should be there right now. It's 2023. People walk into our hospitals with a watch or a Fitbit that measures respiratory rate, ECG, heart rate, SpO2. What do we do? We take it off. We send them to a room in the back of the hallway, we close the door, we give them pain pills, nausea pills, muscle relaxants, what else, sleeping pills, sure. All this stuff is synergistic to opioids. And then we say, we'll stop by every four hours and take your vital signs. Every four hours. Anybody know where that came from? Florence Nightingale, 150 years ago. She never did a randomized control trial. She never showed safety and efficacy. We've come a long way. 2023, we now have, Sue and George basically started this 15 years ago. They were using the Model T to do this and look at the results they have. We now have wireless wearable patches, great monitors. Uh, there's a new monitor out that you can take home, the Halo that's just been approved by the FDA. I, the other day, tested another device that's coming out soon, a little um, patches, the mobile device, and I didn't even know I had it on. We are ready for prime time. The time is now. It's practical, it's affordable, and we gotta stop having people dying behind closed doors in our hospitals. <laughs> George, I took all your time. Yeah, well, and you took, you took the key points, but it's okay. It, you know, we've, we've been working this problem for a long time, and I just want to thank Dr. Ramsey, uh, Joe, the meeting. This session, this is one of those topics that is ready to be solved. It's been ready to be solved. When I thought about these stories, Anders' stories, uh, your son's story, these are exactly uh, what safety is about. This is the epitome of a, a preventable error. And uh, I had really three points I was going to make, and you've made a few of them, but uh, one is uh, just people don't understand the magnitude of the problem. Uh, you're absolutely right. The second is that, uh, it, I said it already, these are not 50% preventable, 80% preventable. These are 100% preventable. Uh, it is absolutely true, and I'll prove it to you based on our data. And finally, uh, again, the takeaway is that uh, usable, practical, affordable, sustainable, 15 years of doing this, the solutions exist today. They've only gotten better. Uh, and we need to get them to everybody. So how big is the problem? You heard it. Let me emphasize that the CDC last year found 16,000 people died from prescription opioids. So out of the 100,000, you know, a big portion are just this kind of story. Um, the second issue is uh, around this 100% preventability. There are so many anesthesiologists here. In the 80s, I was a week into my residency when I learned how to recognize excess opioids, pinpoint pupils, depressed or stopped breathing, and how to treat it. Open the airways, positive pressure breathing, and Narcan. Those things, detection and treatment, have been around and no one should die from opioids. No one. 
uh, in the hospital setting and in the post-operative setting at home. So what are those solutions and what's our proof? You heard some of this from my colleague, Dr. McGrath, this morning. Um, around the mid-2000s, uh, I happened to be the patient safety officer at Dartmouth uh, Medical Center, and I was aware of uh, incidents happening in our hospital uh, related to opioids, and, and Sue shared that there was a young man uh, that had had a minor procedure uh, and, and suffered an opioid overdose death. We had the opportunity to deploy an oximetry-based system that had come out and was designed for use in general care. You can't put, you know, an anesthesiologist in every room, but you can put a detector that can pick up respiratory performance on every single patient, and that's what we did. And that was meant to be a safety net for patients and our staff. By the way, in general care where this is happening, nurses are routinely having to manage five patients. Now, you can't be busy over here and know whether something's going on down the hall. So you have to have a way to support that nurse and redirect their attention. So we deployed this system. We had the ability to look before and after. And we saw, and I'll reiterate some of what you've already heard, because I think it's so important, a 65% reduction in the need for rescue. Because people got the information early and, and modified their behavior. They didn't give the drugs uh, as aggressively, or they might have done their reversal early. In addition, there was a 50% reduction in the need for transfer to the ICU. Now, that's more than just opioids, but let's talk about over 10 years what we observed. We did a look back two years ago and found that over a 10-year period, 111,000 patients that we had monitored, none had opioid-induced respiratory depression and death. None. <laughs> During the ramp-up of adding and spreading that system to all other general care units and all other patients for the entire time they're hospitalized, uh, it took two years, and during that time, 15,000 patients, we saw three deaths due to opioids. So 110,000 none in the subsequent years. In the beginning, before we had gotten this system totally deployed, but we were collecting data very accurately, three deaths. So this is happening. I've talked to Dr. Ramsey and others. It's happening across the country. Every chief quality officer when I was in that role that I talked to could tell stories uh, of this. Uh, I wanted to end with you know, moving from uh, sort of this in the hospital setting and what Frank said, I want to reiterate, the, the FDA granted a de novo uh, approval for a pulse oximetry-based opioid-induced respiratory depression device that can detect that. Um, that system uh, can be prescribed by doctors like yours who want uh, patients to have that, or it's available over the counter. It's available now, as of April. And by the way, the FDA also approved over the counter Narcan. So with a device to detect and the means to treat a nasal spray, uh, I really believe we can eliminate this problem once and for all. So that's, that's a great segue into our next two speakers, but I want to save time for them, but if I could just interject a question that hopefully we can just spend one minute on. Um, what are the barriers to absolute continuous respiratory monitoring in people that are on opioids in hospitals. And to paraphrase our last speaker, if you improve quality and, co and uh, safety, your costs will go down. So don't give me the excuse of cost. What, what, what are the barriers? Yeah, I, I think that um, I'd love to say 
and, and this is just my opinion, that um, it's, it's an issue of leadership, whatever. I think we need regulatory pressure. I think it needs to be a standard of care. Um, I think, as you know, we had a, uh, uh, a congresswoman in New Hampshire who took up a bill to make uh, continuous monitoring of patients on opioids a new standard of care. Uh, whether it's through CMS or other you know, better means, and I, I get the idea that maybe that's a heavy hammer, but I think it just needs to be a standard. Anything in 30 seconds, Frank, to add to that? Or? Evidence, historically, traditionally, it's been no evidence, which we have now of improved outcomes. Cost, which you've took off the table. Ergonomics, we've fixed the ergonomics. They're wearable. And workflow, alarm fatigue, we fixed that. In mo if, for those who want to listen, it's there. The solutions are there. So let me uh, move to Stacy, And I think uh, we're on the brink of a Netflix moment in medicine <laughs> um, with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and wearables. And I can envision a future where patients come in, a lot of things, risk, et cetera, are supported by artificial intelligence. They go home with wearables. All that data is fed into a central repository. It hits something on day three. We need an intervention, et cetera. But maybe Stacy can talk a little bit about what might be going on in the post-operative period, both in the hospital and, and at home. Yeah, thank you. And first of all, thank you to everybody for this incredible meeting. And a lot of the ideas have been shared already. Um, I also want to say sorry. We, uh, I think George and Frank, myself, Joe, were in a meeting 2006, 2007, talking about this problem, talking about solutions. And this group coming together to have science and technology working together to have all of these elements that are now solved for, it is time and we have to do it now. The, when I learned from um, George and Sue and Josh Pike at the time about what had been done at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and that it was possible, that it was possible for technology to save lives, that it was not impossible. For me, every day in the side of the industry part, I realized that my every day had to be working towards solving these lives because we often work on implementations like you said, that from the implementation to the finished implementation, lives keep getting lost. So now we have wearables. We had the FDA call to action to invent solutions to solve and help save lives through the opioid crisis that came after President Clinton here said that apathy and the opioid crisis was a real crisis. We have those steps done. Prior to that, Sir Liam Donaldson had, with the WHO, um, announced the Medication Safety Global Action. So it was already identified all these pieces. There was global action, global solutions, and we are here with wearables. We can, we can monitor, we can make the change. I think for myself as a mom and for everybody else here in the room, when we listen to the stories that have been shared about the complexity of the healthcare worker, the family, science and technology, the part that I think is critical that we make the decision today on is that that entire burden, when a patient is sent home with a drug, goes entirely on the family, 100% on the family. That entire ecosystem is put on the family. A prescription is given. They're supposed to understand if that drug will be okay or could hurt them. They're supposed to stay awake. They're supposed to monitor their loved one. They're supposed to alert a system. And if it doesn't go well, they're supposed to accept that entire burden of the outcome. And as technology providers, we have the wearables, we have the systems that can now move that burden of responsibility of having to be alerted here and use technology to help us. We have to think that it's absurd that in every house of all the houses we live in, it, you would not have insurance coverage if you had a fire if you did not have a smoke alarm. And you would not have insurance for a death of carbon dioxide if you didn't have a carbon dioxide alarm. It's not acceptable. So how could we have it be that if I'm late for work because I didn't send an alarm, that's unacceptable. But as a mother or a wife, you're expected to know if your loved one isn't breathing just by your own intuition. That has to be unacceptable. 
absolutely unacceptable. There are no more excuses left. The wearables, like you said, we don't even notice them when they're on. They do their job. They alert. Peter Zeiss spoke to quality. The quality is there. Every element is there. We have to decide today that the complex system of the hospital is simple and possible in the home. I can write a prescription. Therefore, I can issue a device that will give an alarm to make sure that that person has a chance to have their life saved, that we do not, do not judge everyone for dosage, etc. Errors will happen, but that alarms will happen. We know it's possible. The technology is there. I think, lastly, we have to recognize death due to respiratory depression is very quiet. Death is silent. Death does not make alarms. But devices do, and the technology is there now. So working as a collaborative between science and technology, again, I'm sorry, and we have to make the commitment today that we will work together and we'll make sure the home environment puts us into place because it's not a complex system. It's a one-to-one -one system, and we can make that change now, and we have to make it happen. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, one other actionable uh, item. I know Grant has been working on uh, naloxone, Narcan, for at-home use so that uh, a solution to that person that has been identified as having a respiratory depression can be immediately available. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Absolutely, Dan. I, I think this is actually wonderful because we're talking about both how do you find it and how do you fix it. And I think that actually makes this a, a really powerful discussion. I'm gonna make my comments and, and bring them towards the audience here and give everyone in this room a call to action. A lot of discussion over the last day and a half has been how can we as healthcare providers, how can the hospitals uh, do something different, but everybody in this room can actually do something about this today. Quick show of hands, how many people have leftover narcotics in their house after a surgery? It's got to be more than this. I mean, half the rooms raise their hand. I guarantee you it's almost everybody in this room. <laughs> how many people in this room have nasal Narcan? Three, four. The FDA allowed over-the-counter prescription or over-the-counter access to Narcan in the end of March, and it's going to be widely available in our pharmacies by the end of the summer. The dose is four milligrams, and it's actually uh, believed to be very safe. It's a drug that we use in the hospital all the time. The dose is a little bit different, but it's something that we've used effectively to reverse the opioid overdoses and, and the respiratory depression from the opioids. Now, one thing that is a barrier that keeps people from using it is, number one, is our just willingness to buy it and stock our first aid kits with it, our willingness to admit that it might be an issue. I've got twin daughters who are rising seniors in high school. What do you think the odds are that my daughters or one of their friends might come to my house and take some of those pills? God forbid, I don't want that to happen. But at least if I have Narcan in my cabinet, I can do something to save their lives. Now, moving on, the next barrier is education. And I'm really proud to say that uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Heart Association has made online education freely available. It's a, through a program called Revive Me. And actually, uh, you can just Google Revive Me, and I believe the, the web address is reviveme.com. And this is inspired by another fellow anesthesiologist, Bonnie Milas. And she tragically lost both of her sons due to the opioid crisis. One of her sons became addicted as a result of being prescribed opioids after a surgery. Somewhere between 5 and 10% of our patients after surgery become addicted or dependent on their opioids. So this isn't just a case of even a mistake occurring or some metabolism issue occurring. This isn't about junkies on the street. And, you know, they're people too. And, and to use some of the language that Peter Provost used yesterday, we need to love them too because they are our community. We are all human and we all need to be together. So my charge to everybody in this room is please go buy that Narcan. 
please go watch the Revive Me videos, learn how to use it. Please don't be afraid. And the last barrier is amnesty for people who call 911 looking for help. There are too many tragedies where people call the police or call the ambulance for help, and yet it, their actions end up being criminalized. And we need to move beyond the criminalization and take care of our community and take care of people that we love. So thank you. Maybe in the next couple minutes, uh, so I've been through several waves of opiate use uh, in the perioperative period. Um, one of them was uh, anybody that came through the threshold of an operating room got fentanyl, period. Uh, if I, they did not get it, it was almost like it was malpractice. Uh, the last, you know, it started maybe 20, 30 years ago, but it's really caught on the last 10 years is opiate-free anesthesia, uh, opiate-sparing anesthesia. Do you think any of those make a difference, uh, particularly in triggers for at-home use? Uh, absolutely. And should, should patients be asking for it? So we've actually, the amount of opioids prescribed has gone down since around 2012, 13 uh, by surgeons. Uh, the awareness of multimodal analgesia, we use a lot more regional anesthesia, regional blocks. That has made a huge uh, impact, continue to make an impact in bringing the overall opioid to the community down from surgical procedures. Dan, I think one thing I do want to point out, and it's interesting, in healthcare, I think, and I agree with you, in my shorter time, you know, I've seen this as well. We need to also be careful about the substitutions. And so we've said, oh, opioids are bad, but let's give people a lot of gabapentin. Let's give people a lot of ketamine. And lo and behold, a lot of those medications are also not free. And they also have their own side effects. And so I think things like regional blocks, or even just questioning, why are we treating pain? What about the conversations and telling people, um, you know, you should be a little bit uncomfortable after surgery, and that's actually healthy. That's good. Um, you know, clearly you don't want uncontrolled pain, but at the same time, um, there's almost no such thing as painful <coughs> surgery. Okay, sorry about that. Um, any other comments on that? Or? I, I would say maybe in between, rather than always opioid sparing, uh, we saw massive reductions, 80, 90% reductions in opioids prescribed when surgeons actually looked at the use while still in the hospital and used that to guide what they sent people home with. Prior to that, we actually had an orthopedic surgeon who was doing uh, carpal tunnels and giving people 30 Oxycontins. So I mean, some of that just has to go away. <laughs> you know, the, and, and people just don't need as much, um, it, whether they get an opioid sparing technique or not. This is not really based on opioid sparing. This is just reducing what was rampant prescribing because no perceived risk. OK. And then uh, one comment uh, here that are all uh, paraphrase a little bit. This talks a little bit about healthcare disparities. Um, can uh, this organization advocate for free naloxone? Not everybody can afford to uh, even buy it. So I'm just putting that out there, no, no comments. But I did want to save the last one minute and 39 seconds for Yvonne. If you want to give me uh, your synthesis on this panel, this entire meeting, or any other comments you wanted to make. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, just one thing is instead of, uh, like, I enjoy, I have enjoyed all the discussion that we've, that I've listened to the last couple of days, and as far as, like, my situation, I would like to see the implementation that they were talking about. You know, instead of losing another 3, 10, 12, you know, 100 people for the opioid crisis where um, there are perfect solutions, you know, it would be... Nice for me as a mother, that was one thing that gave me solace after my son died is to hear of patients that were saved that came back in because of the monitors that um, our doctor had sent them home with. But he still ran into a lot of um, frustration from our own hospital about wanting to implement it. And he was adamant, you know, he wasn't going to do surgeries without being able to send them home with the pulse oximeters and the monitors with their opioids. Um, but he just ran into so many roadblocks. And so for me, I would love just to see 
that you would consider, as the other mother spoke before, yeah, you don't think it's going to happen to you, and you just don't want to be thrown into the situation. You don't want it to be your child, but consider how many lives that you can save by just implementing those few little changes in your own hospitals so other lives can be saved. Well, thank you very much to the panel. We're right on time. And thank you again to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for putting this panel on. Great, great panelists. Thanks.